wherever you are, whatever you are currently experiencing in your life right now, realize that you are here to lead. You knew you would. You knew you would from like the other side. And even if you doubt where you fit into this whole picture, you have a very significant role. And so even if you have that doubt, even if you have that vulnerability, lean into it because don't see your vulnerability as a weakness, but it is an opportunity to reach more people. Welcome to 99 Humans. My name is Jeff LaCosta, curious coach and Wall Street Journal bestselling author, striving to understand how little things generate big impact. And I'm Nadia Carta, tech executive and lifestyle coach with a mission to transform lives and corporations by kindling hearts to generate a zeal for life. Each week, we investigate stories about the human side of leadership to re-energize your spirit and help you become a stronger leader. Because the reality is that leadership is messy, goofy, challenging, but always human. Thanks for spending time with us today. Let's dive in. Well, Dave, thank you for being a guest of 99 Humans. We really appreciate your time and learning from you. For our listeners, would you mind introducing yourself and sharing a little bit more of your life and what keeps you busy? Absolutely. Well, first of all, Nadia, thank you so much for having me here. I'm honored and excited to tell everyone a little bit about myself interesting background. I've worked in the corporate world for quite some time, working for some big companies, some big names, the German conglomerate Siemens, where I kind of started my career working overseas out of school, originally from the US, but speak German fluently and took work over there to really use the language skills that I'd put so much time into. And they brought me to the South in the US. I'm originally from the Midwest. And then I lived out in Colorado for a really long time. And they brought me here for work. I worked for them for several years. And then I had the opportunity to go over and work for Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola headquarters being in Atlanta. And yeah, that was quite a magical, fun experience. And then I had an opportunity after working with them for a few years to come work for Kimberly Clark, where I currently work as a global learning and development consultant. It's a great company. I've worked for some big names, but this is really just such a great, caring company and very human, talking about human leadership. And then I do that. That is my nine to five, as it were. But then I also have a coaching business. And so that actually uses astrology and mindfulness and really looking at mindsets to help people to be the best versions of themselves. So the name of my business is Universal Signals. And the reason I called that is because the universe is always sending us signals, but it's our free will to follow them or not to follow them. And through astrology, it's a great way to see what those are. So I really love both the work at Kimberly Clark and the work in this business because I have an opportunity to help develop people both personally and professionally, which is what I'm really about. I'm the type of person I really love to help people to connect with themselves and be the best versions of themselves. And so, yeah, that's a little bit about me and what I'm up to and what I do and things like that. So, Wow. I have to say in those few minutes, you dropped so many nuggets that it's going to be up to us now to decide where we're going. But let me ask you a few more questions because... Sure. I, I wish I want to spend a day or two or maybe like a month with you to unpack it all. First and foremost, I didn't know you speak German. I do. I speak German fluently. I speak Spanish fluently. I love languages. Yeah, I'm a bit of a language geek. And I always knew from a very young age, like when I was living in the Midwest, my parents went to Europe when was it when they went, whenever they went to Europe for the first time and they brought back pictures and different things. I was like, this is incredible. And so I, I've always had that wanting to kind of explore the world and things like that. Wow. So 
Yeah. How? Because German is such a difficult language for, I mean, even for me, and like I'm European, I'm Italian, and I speak few languages, but German, it's really tough, grammatically speaking, pronunciation is very far from English. So did you learn that in school? Like, And also, what drawn you to that specific language and not French or Chinese, for example? Yeah, it's a really good question. So interesting kind of story. When I was in middle school, because I moved out to Colorado with my mom and my brother after she had a divorce from my father, we moved out to Colorado. And in middle school was when I started taking a language. And in that case, it was Spanish. And I just was really drawn to the foreign language. We then moved about a year or two later up to another where I went to high school to another school. And I just was like, let me take another language. And so Initially, I was thinking of taking French, but the schedule didn't work out for me to take French. And so I said, well, let's take German. I do have some German heritage on my mom's side of the family. So Midwesterners, there's usually a lot of German or Irish or Italian or depending kind of on the family history. And so I got into it and it was a little bit different, but I had a good teacher and yeah, and it was a challenge. It was a challenge, but it was a lot of fun too. So amazing. And speaking about signals, I love how this passion for you turned into an opportunity with Siemens and moving there. So where in Germany did you leave? Yeah. So I was in the northern part of Bavaria. So in southern Germany, I was in a town called Würzburg, which is kind of between a lot of people know Frankfurt, one of the main airports in Germany. And then maybe Nuremberg, where there's like the big Christmas market in Germany that's well known. And so it was kind of somewhere in between. It's wine country. It's a very acidic wine, though. It's not like the wine that a lot of people know, the sweet Riesling or something from the Rhine region. But yeah, I was there in a town of about 100,000 people. So it had the nice little castle on the hill and the river and the Aww. old town and I know and things like that. And then I was an intern. I was a bit of a poor intern, so to speak, but I got to travel every month and go somewhere in Germany or in some of the neighboring countries. And it was a, yeah, it was a fantastic experience. It was pretty risky if I think back, but I really wanted to do something to follow my dreams. And as I'm finding when you do that, like doors open and things open up and I had a really good connection with my boss. And he said, Dave, let's get you a full-time job if you want to. And so it was just really, really cool how everything kind of just came together as a result of taking a little bit of a leap of faith you know, into a new situation. Risky? You dropped it with nonchalance, risky. What made it risky at the time? And maybe it was less risky in my mind at the time in that when you're a college student, you're kind of up to like, just go out there and conquer the world. But, you know, it was just right out of school. I finished up semester in the winter and then I was on a plane on New Year's Eve. I went to visit my family for Christmas and then I was on a plane on New Year's Eve to head over there and find an apartment and no furniture and not a lot of the apartments in Germany, at least at the time, were furnished. And so you had to kind of, it was a whole new culture although I was very eager and excited about it because I love those type of things. But new culture, first job, moving somewhere across the world. So a lot of new things, right? So interesting. And sometimes is the unknown. I guess that flying all over the ocean, such a young age, not knowing what was on the other side. I mean, Germany is such a beautiful land, but still something foreign to, to what you did. That's amazing. And yeah. then... I really love that you have all this corporate in your profile, Coca-Cola, Kimberly Clark. Jeff is not here today because he's on a well-deserved time off, but he lives in Atlanta. So uh -huh. I'm sure he would have loved to engage more in that conversation. And there's one thing you said where I would like to dwell on a little bit. When you say that you love how, for example, your company now is so caring and how you are merging your passion for coaching and your practice and astrology, I love what you said about the universe is giving us signals and then it's up to us to follow them or not. And we have the free will to do whatever we want to do. And 
people that are listening to this podcast, they know that I'm a bit quirky and unconventional. So all that you said really resonates with me. However, let's say it, we're not the majority. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I still see that there's a bit of uncomfortable feeling when we speak about corporate work and some of the woo-woo. Mm. Uh, mind you that last year I was able to bring 85 people to a sound healing session in a sanctuary in Colorado near Boulder, yeah. the so Star awesome. House. Everyone should go if you have the chance. But, you know, for those of us that are believers and those of us that see the positive impact on the workspace, and when you think about the executives, they're still a little bit old style. Like, yeah. they look at you like you are a zombie coming from this fairy tale word, then there's a bit of judgment as well, because how do you know that you're not just talking that you do land the bottom line? So long sentence to ask you this question, Mm -hmm. which is how have you been reconciling these two personas that you Mm -hmm. have in yourself, corporate Mm -hmm. and astrologer, and coach, so three personas, really, and making sense of all of this in your life? Yeah, it's a really great question. And it's something that I think about Nadia a lot. Because there's times when I think, well, do I just go one route and do that, right? And I feel that my purpose here on this planet is very multidimensional. So I've come to honor the diversity that is me, And I think for a long time, I didn't do that. I mean, it was just a couple of years ago that I launched this practice and really came out, so to speak, as an astrologer. I've been studying astrology and practicing this for 10 years now, but I would just share it with friends or people who I felt comfortable with sharing. But I maybe the pandemic and everything that was happening, I was like, no, you need to bring forth your talents and your service to people, right? People are really needing it now. And I think a lot of shifts have happened, like very strong shifts in the last couple of years, which have really shown that the old way that has gotten us to where we are is no longer working in so many regards, right? There is something, and I've thought about this a lot because I'm very thankful for the opportunities I've had to be in many different professional roles There always has been something where I've been like, but I'm a deeper human than just the bottom line. There's more to that. It's a bit shallow to just think that it's all about that. But I understand there is an important part of that with running any business and things like that, right? With those things and those concerns. But for me, it's always been a matter of why. Like I'm always asking the question, but why? What's the deeper question? And so... Um, I do like that the work that I do, at least in my space, I do get to play in that a little bit. But what I'm liking about my practice is I'm able to go a little bit deeper. But it is tricky. Let's be honest. I mean, let's be honest. In the corporate space, I think it's getting better. People are appreciating more things around mindfulness, wellness, and things like that, where it used to be like separate things. There are some companies where, no, this is an important part of us doing business, right? It's not a a separate item. And I've been lucky to be now playing in a space where I'm doing some more things around growth mindset, psychological safety, which I think ties in well with just awareness in general and the spiritual. Because if you don't have, and as I was thinking before coming on here to, to talk with you, Nadia, I was thinking, what could I kind of do to kind of to connect these things? And I think the big thing right now that a lot of corporations, they're just not quite there yet, is they're, they've got like one foot in the old ways, in the old world. And they're kind of trying to play in the new ways, but it's like infancy stages, And so people are still leaning on the old practices of command and control and fear, really. Like, I'm going to keep my people in line, and this isn't all managers, but I'm going to keep my people in line because that's the way that most people do it around here. And that's the culture in some cases. And not even if it's like really cutthroat. 
it could still be just this kind of implicit way of behaving that sends a message without saying it clearly that if you mess up, you're going to be in trouble and your job's on the line or, you know what I mean? It's just that severity. And I think we have some work to do and we have a great influence. I think what we do right in this space to be able to influence and say, Hey, the reason you're not getting your results, the reason why people are getting burnt out, the reason why people are leaving and there's the great resignation is because you are missing something deeper in the equation. And I don't know if a lot of executives are really ready to hear that. They're just so used to, and they grew up in a system, a very different system. So for them to have that mindset shift is one, but it's also the mindset shift and then changing the behavior and modeling the behavior to their, their people to really show up in a different, more vulnerable way, vulnerability, so big, right? And that is what I'm seeing is the opportunity. And with business leaders, if they can do that more, but sometimes it's tough. It's tough depending on the pressure of the company and the culture that you're in. I mean, I feel we could talk about this truly for ages. Among the things you said, when you said it's an important part of us doing the business, sometimes I have the perception that this mountain to climb and the mm. hill is very steep. Especially, I mean, I'm sure you are on all social media and you see what's going on. We are in a time of economical pressure. Uh, we are recording this podcast in April. And the first thing that leaders are open to drop is everything that is non-business essential. So mm. how, you know, when you see also yourself in your position, Oh, there's a group of leaders, let's say, I, I call myself a corporate witch. And so when I think about these modern corporate leaders and wizards and all that we are, right, we are a, a small group still. We're not the majority. Mm -hmm. We're definitely the minority. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's all the rest, yeah. right? We know we fit in our body that we are right. We see the impact, the positive impact of those inspired actions that we are bringing forward, yet the mm -hmm. mountain to climb is very challenging. Have you had experiences in this path that you are walking in your life and corporate life, let's call it inspired corporate life, that maybe some days you're like, you know what, it's not worth it, or I feel that this is so hard. How have you been leaving, right? Being the different one that is bringing inspired wisdom into this traditional world. Yeah, it's a really great question. I think my practice really is the fuel around that. It's really helping to align me in so many ways so that I can show up in a different way because, and people at my work, at least in my team, they know I'm an astrologer, and some will ask questions, some will be, I just don't get it, whatever it is. And I don't push anything on anyone, but I really, I do know that there's a part of me that is meant to have a big impact. And so there is the idea of, oh, just leaving the corporate job and doing fully what I do, which is very much a possibility, especially with the work I've just embarked on with my parenting program, I just rolled out. However, there's a division. There definitely is that feeling of being, I'll be very honest, feeling torn between, because it's an energy thing too, right? Like, where do I put my energy? Do I put it in the grind of working within kind of the corporate structure? Or do I fully commit to making a difference in and fully having my attention on my practice? and still helping people and still connecting with people. But I am a bit of a spiritual politician and that might sound really strange, but I really do feel like I have a role to play as a spokesperson. I feel like I've been given some qualities and traits of being able to be 
an influencer, and this isn't to sound arrogant, but to be able to go and speak with people and be able to, and I, coming from a, a real loving place, obviously not this like people think of politician like fake, but really what I mean by that is really being able to influence on a grander stage, right? And so I do feel that I've been given a lot of gifts that help me to bring that message to a larger group of people. And I feel very honored for that. And I wouldn't want to go hide away in a cave somewhere or on a mountain in Tibet, although great to visit and have that experience, but not to stay up on the mountain there. I don't think that would be honoring my intention, which is to get the message out more universally to people and really truly be a teacher that can help people that are in different places. I do have to say that just coming back from the mountains, sometimes I do think it would have been probably not so bad to be hiding in Sedona and just meditate all day and journal and read the birth charts. I bet. Oh man. <laughs> it was kind of healing and recharging. I love what you just said about being a spiritual politician. It's such a beautiful way to put it. I love that you came out with your team. Oh my God, very powerful in telling them, hey, you know what? I'm an astrologer. I mean, I wonder what would they think if you if they get an email from you today with Mercury retrograde and saying, how should I be experiencing this email? Have you it's... ever... Sorry, go ahead. No, go, go ahead, go ahead. I was wondering if you ever found yourself in a situation where... You told people what you do, and they were like, oh, I don't know if I can't believe in you anymore. Sometimes I feel the skepticism when we do say what we do. Oh, yeah. So what speaks to that immediately for me is I've been reaching out because I've just launched this parenting program, an eight-week program to help parents raise great kids. And a lot of it is using the tools of astrology. And so I've been reaching out to everybody that I know, both professionally and just personally. And some people are just like, oh, astrology, is that the horoscope you read in the news, whatever I used to read in the newspaper? And I'm like, no. So there's a huge opportunity, first of all, for education and awareness, because some people just don't have that, which actually, in a way, it's been good because it's reinforced for me. There just are some people that don't have that awareness because they haven't had that experience. And it's not that they're willingly ignorant, but they're just ignorant because they haven't had somebody in their life that is in that space. And I think for me, I'll be quite honest, it really does challenge my own sense of security because it does put you in a very vulnerable situation where you have to be like, do I really believe in what I do? And then it helps you to, so this is what it did for me, Nadia, which is interesting. When I opened up my practice and I really was opening up to other people about this, I was like, what's my why behind this? Because I hadn't really thought through that. But when I got to the why, I knew that this was why I was here and I could better articulate that to people around why I do this and how I can help people have more self-awareness, have better relationships. And again, it, that it's not a religion for me, but it is something that has helped me that I can bring to other people. And mm -hmm. so, but a lot of people, they have the view of like, oh, he has a crystal ball and maybe he's wearing a witch hat or something like that. And I joke around. Right. I make light of because humor is helpful. Right. When you're pleased. We you do know? have crystal. Uh, funny you're, you're talking about crystal balls because do you have it one happens one? that my cauldron was just here on my desk from one of my past <laughs> <rituals>. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it might be part of the picture, but I try to like help people loosen up. There was somebody I did a reading for a couple nights ago and one of my, my New York clients Every year he gifts some family members and friends. And so it's always interesting to see, first of all, if people reach out to get their reading. Um, of all, if they do, if there's that skepticism and one of his nieces reached out and I could tell she was, this is bringing up some things for me, but I don't know if I want to show mm -hmm. that I really buy into this. Because if you do, I think that takes a whole other level of 
belief or understanding about the way that the world works. And so, yeah. um, I just said, uh, and I don't know if this is too far, but it's the whole, it's the whole point around psychological safety that you just mentioned, right? Because mm-hmm. in corporations, and since this is a podcast about leadership and human leadership, it's almost this connection to say, hey, the more we create a space in this corporate environments for people to truly be what they are, and it might be being an astrologer, it might be being a witch, it might be to be whatever you want to be mm-hmm. of any sort of form. And the more we foster this environment where it's okay to bring your full self forward and how that impacts the bottom line, how that impacts the well-being and how that impacts everything, really, relationships. The fact that truly helps get truly better helps. business results. Yeah. When you said that, what you had me thinking about is what the pandemic has forced, which it's created its challenges. But what I think it's forced is more of an individualized approach to interacting with employees So if you are a leader, you obviously went through probably the the experience and let you, unless you had like frontline employees that you were kind of in proximity to, and you were kind of working in that manner, but you have had to, especially if there's been a hybrid component Mm -hmm. that has forced the shift from you are present. I see you, I manage you, I control your time schedule, that kind of industrial revolution way of operating that still lingers some, we're not quite there yet. But I think what's happening is leaders are on the pandemic is forced. And I think it's all in alignment with Pluto moving into Aquarius and the Aquarius age of like individualization. It's Mm -hmm. truly Aquarius energy, not to go down the astrology path too much, but it's moving from a Capricorn energy of very controlled business is you kind of conform into the system and you get things done. And Aquarius is very, no, it's the individual first within the system. And so what, and we're seeing this with our younger generations, which is encouraging to me. So going back to the mountain, I think at least we might have some people that are already like over the mountain and they're like, get some ropes and they might help pull more people up the mountain because Gen Z, I'm encouraged. I really am. I really feel like they are breaking away and they're like, no more of this madness. I mean, you are reading my mind because when you were speaking about individualism and Aquarius and all that, in my mind, I literally had the Gen Z picture and saying, you know what, enough with the bullshit and I do what is right and then I'm going to bring others along to do what is right. And interesting, and I'm sure you've already done this analysis, but, you know, we are still on the energy of the eclipse of a couple of days ago. We are entering Tauros, and that's also a very different energy. Again, today, there's this retrograde. Have you ever find yourself that with the knowledge that you have, you were, let's say, in a day of your corporate responsibilities, Uh and you were like, I cannot take this. Like, I know that, by the way, the universe is going, is not going to be right, and you had to retract and you were like, yeah, I'm not going to do this because I know it's not going to land well. Have you, because you, the knowledge that you have, it's a double-edged sword. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know a lot. Like when you know what's going on and you, knowing the moon signs, because they change so often, you can kind of tell the forecast for the day what the mood's going to be. It does help though, that awareness where you okay, I can back off a little bit or tempers are flared today and it's probably not going to help to push this anymore. And that does help a little bit. Sure. So there, there are situations where, or it's in mercury retrograde and, or you kind of chuckle when you're like, yeah, technology's acting up or, you know, things are delayed or thing. And you just are and occasionally I'll throw out the mercury retrograde thing. And some people will be like, what, what? Like they still don't get it, but I'm just like, yeah, mercury retrograde, at least in my mind, I know what's going on. But yeah, it, I mean, it really does guide my decisions, not fully in every moment, but it does, it is a great guide. It's really like, if you look at the astrology, astrology is so connected to nature 
is so connected to the purity of the cycles of life. That's what it gets down to, whether people really kind of understand it as such, because we've gotten so far away from it. But it's almost like the way I equate it is like back when we were all living in caves and we put little like symbols on the cave, it would show different things in life that would go on. And then the astrology is with the symbols and stuff is synced with time and synced with the natural progression that you have to go through to get from here to here in your life. And so if you can get in sync with the cycles, astrology is one way. Meditation is another great example. You feel the flow. You're already knowing it's kind of raining right now, or it's really light. And I can, you're able to honor your own signals more. And I think that's where I am never a one to talk about doom and gloom, but I do feel having a sense of what astrology does offer to so many people, including leaders, is an ability to understand the current weather and where we are in it. So if you are in the winter season, you don't need to be pushing everybody to get out there and like try to plant crops. It doesn't make sense. It's not to say that you can't continue to execute, but I think a good leader is aware of where their people are in the cycle of things. So, and have a bigger picture. Oh my God, I love what, like this last sentence about the weather, because often we think that a leader job is just to get things done and run and then land it and whatever. And for me, the leaders of the future are those leaders that are able to be so present that they can read whatever's going on and being that island of calm in the storm and guide fiercely their teams with our flaws and being vulnerable. We're not perfect and we all have our challenges. As I said, I'm a corporate witch, and so I read a lot about witchcraft. And this past December was so healing when I was reading all about Samhain, Yule, and all of the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people dread winter. A lot of people are really, they start entering this mode. Oh, my God. And for the first time in like 40 years, Mm -hmm. I was so happy that it was winter. Mm. Because I was embracing the winter spirit, Mm. being inner, being home, more time to journal. And the fact that I knew what was going on in nature and I was tuned in with the cycle was giving me permission. And so the way I translate all that you said for me is about giving permission to be. Beautifully stated. Yes. It gives you permission to be. And when you are in that beautiful state, which is so exciting to hear that you experience that through that connection and that knowing, you're really in the flow of the natural, right? Mm -hmm. So you're really like leveraging the power of nature, which I mean, maybe sounds a little bit woo, but really I think most people can conceptualize that again, the seasons, I'm not going to do something in the winter that I might do in the spring. I might not do something in the fall that I'm going to do. And there, I think people can connect with that, that everything has its cycles. And if you honor those cycles, you're really going to be more productive. You're going to be more effective. You're going to be doing the right things at the right time and not the wrong things and getting frustrated and beating yourself up with why am I, there's no seeds coming out of the ground just to go back to the winter analogy. Well, it's winter. You're supposed to go within. It's kind of like a time of really going within and getting all that energy kind of centralized. And then the spring will come. And it is the bigger picture way of looking at things. And then just honoring that there's some dynamics to life that we could learn a lot from nature about. And that I think is really, if you look at all what, you know, maybe in the woo community, we're so sensitive to, because I think we are spirits that just, we came in and we said, we will stay very sensitive. We won't become numb or deconditioned from this. So we stayed very close to nature. We still are right. And we hold that purity of connection that reminds people in certain ways that this is what it's about. We lost it. Like 
thousands and thousands of years ago, but it was there. And we still have pockets of people that understand that. And it's not so crazy to think about it, but we've gotten separated from nature a lot. And these organizations, some with good intentions, some with not good intentions, have government, in some case, religious institutions have separated us in some ways from that connection and said, well, the true power is not in your natural self. You have to go and do this to be able to be good. And it's the furthest thing from the truth. And so we've gotten very disconnected and we've gotten very in our, in our heads, right? The masculine principle, which is very important. The masculine principle, we need to be able to go out and interact with our world and do certain things, but we've gotten so disconnected and the feminine principle and this was just coming to me last week, actually, when I was involved in a meditation, which was just mind blowing. The feminine principle has been shamed, which is connected with nature. And therefore we have all lost our connection in a lot of ways, because the only way you can try to control nature, which you never can ultimately is to create shame and guilt and say, you don't have that connection. And it's when you connect that to sexuality, oh my gosh, talk about control, right? So it's really getting back to the idea. And I think honestly, it's why we in this space, there is that judgment or that because it's kind of been ingrained in the, oh, she's a witch. Well, maybe we need to burn her at the stake or she's, you know what I mean? Like those kind of things that came up to control the nature of that connection. And so there's still, now, thank God it's not to that extreme today, but there's still that bridge to cross to help people. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? I mean, it's general, it's generational trauma. There's a, there's a lot of literature. I've been reading a book from Lisa Lister about it, mm -hmm. where, especially for women, we are carrying this generational trauma throughout ages because back in the days, they didn't know that women have their periods for a reason. Mm -hmm. And one day this bump would grow and no one would know why. They didn't know the connection about how do we conceive babies and all of that stuff. And it would simply be, oh, she's a witch. She's growing a life, so we cannot trust her. So all of that misconception that eventually brought patriarchy to prosecute and see women as these evil things. So there's a lot, like we could almost record another episode only about this because then still today, a lot of women, we have to face this type of. Absolutely. It's so unfair. And it just, I mean, I was so, it, in the moment I went through that meditation last week, there was just such deep sadness for me in a way, because I knew what not being a woman, but maybe in lifetimes past, having still that sensitivity, that there was this unnatural disconnection that women are still having to face and have had to for generations. That is one of the most purest connections, mm -hmm. but it's being distorted and called perverted or wrong or whatever. And so I just had this sense of, oh my gosh, like the, now it can never be truly controlled, which is a good thing, right? Like mother nature cannot be put in her place. She will win out, but it's still that idea that how hard is it? And it's not just affecting women, it's affecting men in that when men are not able to truly be in alignment with their feminine energy, so everybody is suffering because of that. And so, I mean, not to go down on a tangent too much, but it really, for me, connecting it back to kind of everything we talked about here so far, it really made it clear in my mind of why maybe in the corporate space, which is built around a lot of these masculine principles and ignoring the feminine principles sees those things that are considered feminine principle as strange, mm. right? The trauma of the shaming and the exclusion and the marginalizing over generations and millennial it is why we're in this situation where we're like, oh my gosh, people, please, we got to get back to where we were. But people are like, well, we can't because that's the trauma. 
right? We just, we don't do that. that. That's not what we learned to do in my family. So that's where it becomes tricky until people get to a point, which I think we're getting to, where it is no longer really sustainable, where people are having to go within in this kind of more feminine way to get that connection because you can't find it externally. I love this. I love this train of thought. We might have to record another episode, Dave, because there's so much that I would still want to continue saying. Before I ask you a final question, you spoke about this eight week program, 12 parents. I love that. I'm a mom. I have two daughters. You and I have been chatting about it. I might sign up for it. It's such a great program. Would you share in one minute a little bit more on why do you believe that this can be transformational and also the impact in corporation? Because there's a lot of parents in the corporate environment. There's a lot of parents. I am so passionate about this. And obviously I could go a lot of different directions with my coaching business and the astrology, but it came to me in the last couple months because of some clients I've had, parents and their kids and the huge impact it's had working with them, that this can really, speaking of trauma, break generational trauma, Mm. that we inadvertently carry over from how we learn from our parents as parents to parent. Mm. And it's very subconscious, unless you're very aware of it, right? And you're working through it, which is fantastic. But it's really helping parents who in a lot of cases are just really wanting to get to know their kids And a lot of it is, first of all, knowing yourself on a very deep level. So the program, the eight week program, it's very intentionally eight weeks because it's it's one on one coaching with me. I mean, having that contact with the 24 hour turnaround time of getting in contact with you exercises reflection. But the first week or so, knowing yourself as a parent, knowing how you were parented, those traumas and pains that you still carry. And then kind of clearing that space so you are having a clarity, getting with your kid, knowing their astrology, then knowing the astrology of the relationship, building it back, solidifying it, and then getting it to a place where you can honor this as a relationship for this lifetime and many more and have a clear, purer way of looking at it without all the other debris from what has been carried over or society has carried over. And that's a lot of the stress I think parents face because of societal pressure and trauma. So wonderful. Oh my God. Maybe we do an episode, a full episode on this. We should see. Dave, what would be your one recommendation and advice as a summary of this conversation today for whomever will listen to this episode? Yes, I would say... Wherever you are, whatever you are currently experiencing in your life right now, realize that you are here to lead. You knew you would. You knew you would from like the other side. And even if you doubt where you fit into this whole picture, you have a very significant role. Mm -hmm. And so even if you have that doubt, even if you have that vulnerability, lean into it because Don't see your vulnerability as a weakness, but it is an opportunity to reach more people. And we will be seeing more and more of a need for leaders to play in this space. So the sooner you can do that, even if you feel exposed a little bit, I've seen even just with what I've done, you will get to people that really could use your help and they really could use your leadership. And so courage, having the courage to step out with your heart Maybe get out of your mind because a lot of us, especially if you're in the business world, we use our mind a lot, right, to solve problems. But get into your heart, listen to your heart, honor your path, and people will follow you and you will help so many people because of that willingness to step out a little bit and do something that might not be considered quite the mainstream. You will be known for that and you will have a following and you will make an impact. So that's, that is my message from kind of pulling this all together and what I've experienced. And it's so beautiful and it's so wonderful. And you get to connect with people like we've connected that you never would have imagined. There's other souls out there. There's a community too. You're not alone. You're not I alone. I love that. I love that. It's about attracting those that are alike. Let's that's say. right. Where can people find you, Dave? 
Yeah. So the best way to find me is I'm very active on Instagram. If you're on Instagram, it's universal underscore signals underscore astrology. And then if you want to check out my website, it's www.universal-signals.com. You can look out there for, I give readings and things like that. And I'm, I'm standing up my program for parents, which will be coming soon. But if you're interested in that, just DM me on Instagram if you want to. And I'd be happy to let you know more about that. And I'd be happy just to connect with you because we're all in this together. So let's support each other and continue to do that as we all kind of really bring our message forward. Well, I love that. And I'm very curious to see what else the universe is going to bring us. So I hope that even if we recorded this in a retrograde, everything is going to be clean and smooth. And this is going to be a wonderful episode. That's Thank right. Thank you so much, Dave. Thank you, Nadia. This was great. I really appreciate it. It was great being here today and talking with you about this Aww. great stuff. So. Well, we will, uh, we will touch base soon. Sounds Bye.